hello there and welcome again to Mission Unstoppable Live. How are you? We are here on Facebook and so happy to be joining you today. It's Thursday. It's a special day for Mission Unstoppable. We're never, oh, it's Wednesday, I should say, March 27th. We're never really here on a Wednesday, but I am this week because this is my last week before I go on, let's say, hiatus. <laughs> My guest today is Michael Priv. Michael was born in the Soviet Ukraine. He arrived to the USA in 1979, and he went on to graduate University of Pittsburgh, and he became a construction engineer. Well, something happened. <laughs> he was intrigued by Scientology one day, and he ended up joining the church. He went on staff as a Dianetics auditor in 1987, and he quickly moved up the organization to rank at the highest monastic order, the C organization, where he spent 18 years managing translations for the church until he walked off his post in protest to the policies of corruption at the top of the Scientology organization. He not only had a harrowing escape from the KGB while in Russia, bringing Scientology to the Russians, but he was later tried for his crimes by his church in the USA and spent a year in the Sea Org prison in Los Angeles until his dramatic escape in 25. More about that for sure. Michael's writing career then began in earnest in 2008 with the publication of his first novel, Friends of Fred. It was followed by his first sci-fi novel, The Fifth Battalion, then his autobiography, The Golden Fleece. More short stories, Michael then published Roto-Rooter, and most recently he released a psychic healing guidebook, You Are Psychic, The Healer's Handbook. It was his attempt, he says, to train anyone into becoming psychic. He also completed the screenplay for the 5th Battalion and working on his sequel, The Baltazar Conspiracy. Oh, and now he wants us to believe he's just a regular guy who lives in the Bay Area and works as a home insurance adjuster for a major carrier. <laughs> okay, Michael. <laughs> Some might believe you and others wouldn't. <laughs> wow. Like I said, that your, your life sounds like you belong in a Tom Clancy novel. I mean, it's absolutely incredible what's you know yeah yeah first of all uh thanks for having me uh very happy to be here with you frankie and um yeah what's the point of you know kind of like dragging on and couching and potato in on the couch you know yeah yeah well let's this is mission unstoppable and i like to go back to when people were young and what they thought life was going to be like for them and so you were a young boy in the ukraine and you know, in 1979, your family emigrated to the U United States. Um, but when you were in the Ukraine, you know, young, young little young Michael, Misha, what, what were you going to be when you grew up? Well, I wasn't totally sure, but I knew that whatever that was going to be, it wouldn't be in the, in the Ukraine. That's for sure. Because uh, I considered that place unlivable, like Soviet Union, even like Russia now. It's just not for you know, normal humanoids. It's just like, I never got into that whole thing that's happening in there. And it has been happening for 1500 years. Uh, communists uh, were responsible for some of it, but not all of it. But anyway, so yeah, I didn't like the, the, it over there very much. And uh, also the spiritual pursuit was completely uh, a closed path for me in there. There was no religion, no information of any kind. It's just, not, I couldn't stay there. I knew I had to leave. And I wasn't totally sure what I was going to do, but definitely somewhere else. And had your family always lived in the Ukraine? Like, you go back? Yeah. Yes, uh, they're, uh, basically they're uh, Jews. Uh, Jewish people living in the Ukraine, uh, kind of historically oppressed and this and that and so forth. And, uh, yeah, as far as we know, because uh, in the Soviet Union in general, and in my family in particular, all the roots are kind of cut off because of the World War II, where all the relatives got killed. Right. So there's no family lore to remember going back farther than maybe 50 years kind of thing. You know? Wow. Yeah, I mean, my, my, my great-grandfather came from Galencia in 1894. I think he was born Pesach, uh, Israel Pesach Strachny was his name. And, and he... he gathered his children and dressed up like women and and laughed in a caravan i guess you know to to poland to uh to salzburg austria and and you know that's where they stayed in, i guess until the war and most of them were also killed off there i just finished a book about that actually but um so it's very interesting to me to meet somebody from from that area again uh, with your perspective on on how you know the pogroms and and how the people are, are just so 
oppressed. Everybody's really oppressed. Correct. Yeah, aren't they? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a different way to live, I guess, that, than we live here. Which, which surprised me then, I guess, um, when, you, when you worked, well, let's, let's talk about, um, okay, you graduated university, you were going to be in construction, um, like a planner, is that what you did? What did you do? Well, uh, yes, I found the job uh, after I graduated. I found uh, found the job here in Hayward. So the university is in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. But uh, I sent out some 120 or whatever it was resumes at the time on paper, and you know, letters. And uh, I got one uh, good response that I was hired here in Hayward in a large construction company as a project manager. Okay. How so, old were you? Um, so that was... Uh, I was 26. Okay, so 26 years old, um, and you were in Hayward when you when they kind of inducted you into Scientology. Is that where you first met? Yes, uh, well, in San Francisco, but yeah, I lived in Hayward and I worked in Hayward, and uh, but that actually happened in San Francisco. Um, uh, would you like to hear about that? How that happened? I or? do want to hear about how that happened because I, I it's, it, it just boggles the mind in some ways because your personality is like, screw off, leave me alone. And okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it was very interesting. Basically, what happened was, uh, um, well, actually, it was very funny, actually. Yeah. So <laughs> there, there, there was this, this uh, little, uh, pretty little girl who dragged me literally by my sleeve into the church in San Francisco. I was just passing by, like I was accidentally passing by. Yeah. And she just dragged me into the church to do a personality test. And the only reason that happened, why I even let myself being dragged in there, is because when I was trying to shake her off, about half a dozen homeless people started converging on me, asking, Kim, is this man bothering you? Do you need any help with this guy? Who is this? You know? And I figure, well, this is what I need, like, first thing in the morning, I need now to, to fight with, uh, with, with homeless people, you know, in, uh, in San Francisco. So anyway, so I went in and I ended up doing, it's a longer story, which is all in my, the golden fleece, but basically it's funny. But basically, finally, she evaluated my personality test for me, um, this girl by the name Kim, and the evaluation took approximately 10 sec seconds and went like this. Okay, Michael, bad news. You are unhappy, irresponsible. Uh, you're, um, you know, you, you don't like people. People don't like you. Do you have any pets? Or oh, you have fish? Well, your fish hates you, Michael. You know, it just went like this. Thank and uh, yeah, and as all that, you're very aggressive. So you're also a potential murderer. So uh, <laughs> you're not going to live long. You're probably going to die young. And, and, you know, hopefully you are not going to take anybody with you. And I just completely lost it. I was yelling and screaming, looking for a manager, and I stormed out of there and I couldn't sleep. And next morning I went back just to tell Kim everything I thought about her, her mother, any relatives she had, and <laughs> any other material of sexual explicit nature, you know. And she just handled the hell out of me. Anyway, it's a, it's a long story. It's, a, it's funny. It's all in the book, but basically... It's funny. Now, this is in the book, The Golden Fleece. And yeah. I have a feeling, Michael, that your mouth gets you into a lot of trouble. Yeah, sometimes. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I get smarter now. I'm almost 60, so now I'm okay. a little smarter. Than but yeah, I used to be really bad. Yeah. You so, see, I, I can't like I can't keep track of everything I'm saying. I have to say it, and then I listen to it, and I think about it. I can't like you know, no in advance was going to come out of there, you know. So the you were, she told you that you were about to be a murderer pretty much. And, you know, yeah. join them and they'll fix you? Well, so, 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 yeah. So she said, so basically to make a long, it is a little longer story, but to make it short, they gave me five hours of Dianetics uh, procedure, which is called auditing, free for taking this test and putting up with their crap. And uh, basically through different manipulation and so forth and my curiosity obviously i took it and um, i had the uh, asthma that i was born with i had uh, i always had asthma i had two inhalers as you know any asthma person knows you know so i was always working with two inhalers and so forth so anyway so i had this session of genetics uh, auditing and i lost my asthma right then and there and it never came back and i also gained some other interesting things uh, including this button that I had on control that nobody can control me 
like everything can I evaporate them is off in my whole universe, you know. And it was just a free session. But is it? Do you think today it's designed to bring anybody and everybody in, and everybody and anybody will somehow lose something? Well, uh, I worked. I worked in there as a Dianetics auditor for almost a year before I joined the C organization, and I worked with people from the street. The truth of the matter is that the human psyche is a little more complex. It, it doesn't work on everybody the same way, but the idea behind Dianetics is a sound idea. It will help you. Uh, there are other barriers in the way that uh, you know should be taken off out of the way, but there is no time to do it if you grab somebody from the street and sit them down. Uh, there is no way to do that. So it works in different ways, but it's not going to hurt you. And so, uh, it, it is actually a pretty good, uh, you know, psychotherapy type. Thing. After reading your book, I, I came away with with the thinking that that. Everything that the church as a religion offers, you liked. You just didn't like the people, the way it was run. Is that a fair statement? Like, well, you... I really like the people. I don't like the organization. Oh, okay. the, the organization is created by Elrond Hubbard, who was just not a real good guy. He was not a real likable guy. It's just no no way of saying it in a different way. He, he had, like the rest of us, he, he is basically good, and he wanted to help, and he is a brilliant guy, and so forth. But he didn't trust people very much. He didn't like people very much. And he wanted to help them, but they were kind of like more like a, a, a homogeneous mass over there somewhere for him. And uh, so the organization that he created is punitive, suspicious, you know, uh, kind of harsh. Um, and also it has this tendency of setting itself apart from the rest of the human race, you know. Like basically everybody is bad. Like everybody who is not a Scientologist is a wog, which basically means stupid, immoral, like low life, kind of like a monkey, you know, um, you know, animal, you know. And then of course there are psychiatrists who he hated wholeheartedly, and then there are government government employees of all kinds were enemies to him. Then there is media that he hated as well. So all together, o- overall, basically probably there was about two three people that he liked. You know. It's, you know, it's so interesting that there was a part in the book, and I don't have it in front of me, but you were describing something, and it sounded kind of like like, like uh, the president today, the same personality disorder. <laughs> it was well, very, yeah, there, very... there was definitely, there was definitely wow. that, oh, man, there was definitely that, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, like, a huge streak of narcissism. But unlike the president today, uh, Elrond Hubbard actually achieved a huge thing. He actually, in addition to his personal uh, peculiarities and shortcomings uh, and so forth, he was a genius guy. And he was a genius researcher. And one thing he had, he, he had unshakable, unshakable integrity in following where his research leads him. He had no agenda. He wasn't trying to prove something before it happened. He wasn't looking for proofs for his theories or whatever. You know what I'm saying? He, he was actually following the lead, even though they created huge, uh, unbelievable uh, difficulties uh, for him. Like, for example, um, working in Dianetics, which he started at first, um, anybody, any practitioner of Dianetics knows that the, the root of all aberrations, of all problems that people want to handle, is always outside of this lifetime. So... So he followed, so he was strictly against it. He was an engineer by education also, and he was just like, he was completely um, horrified by this idea of creating this whole thing that there are all these past lives and there is nobody can really say uh, how it all works and this and that, but he followed it and that's how Scientology was created. And he was ridiculed for that and he, he had a lot of problems you know, but he followed it through and took the difficult paths as long as it was actually the result of his. But was this a download to him, or he created it? No, he created it. He definitely created it. He created it based on Eastern religions, okay. but he definitely created it. It didn't exist before him. I've never seen. I studied twenty-eight different religions and practiced some of them, and uh, I've never seen anything similar to the to concepts uh, 
that exists in the United States. You know, States. It, it was kind of interesting. Well, it was in, my husband was raised Mormon, and he felt like he had been uh, uh, duped, let's say. And and when I, we were watching the documentary on Mike on, on Muscogee and on David, and it did feel like Mormonism. It felt very similar. How you know you're you're disconnected from everybody else. You're just in this little society. They have their own rules, and you know the bishop's going to see you, and you're going to get in trouble, and you have to wear the secret. You know this and that, and it, it did kind of feel like that. And and I was kind of surprised that somebody who had been raised in a country where your freedoms had been taken from you would would thrive in an organization where your freedoms were taken from you. Well, there is a secret to that because your freedom cannot be taken from you. You see, it, it's it's an apparency. Like if you kind of don't don't get that, um, then you can't really operate in this kind of oppressive. Uh, well, regime. I understand but, that. You know, in your head, you can you can like like Nelson Mandela. He was free in prison. However, did, why would you stay eating rice and beans when you didn't have to? And, and well, be you know well, somebody well, yelling at you and 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 dehumanizing you. Like why? The, 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 it offers quite a lot. I am trying to explain it in a book. That's kind of like a, a really normal question. I really understand it. I spent 18 years in there, and and you know those were some of the best years I I had. That was a third of my life, and I wouldn't actually change it for anything. I had the best friends in the world. I had uh, a huge organization that was actually expanding and helping people all, all around the world. You know, and I was a part of that. And it was uh, fascinating. I spent about five years uh, traveling all around the world, uh, living in many countries uh, for some extended period, you know, for some weeks yeah, and sure. stuff. I, I really That's loved the it. That's fun and part. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, there was a lot of fun, but even not a fun part. You know, what doesn't kill you makes it stronger. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and Sea Org makes everybody a lot stronger in many different ways. One of them is because, you know, you don't get killed. So you get strong. But so it's the military, ways. right? I mean, that's why people send their kids to the military or, or to private school. I went to private school and I felt like, you know, all these rules, like I couldn't thrive in rules. Like I hate rules. Don't, don't give me a rule because I'm not going to be a happy camper. But, you know, you had to do it. Um, or you got in trouble. I got in trouble. I had to, you know, play tennis and go swimming and do all these horrible things <laughs> that I didn't want to do <laughs> because I was overactive or, or whatever the case may be. But in your case, it was a lot worse than that. They they really, uh, and not just to you, to a lot of most of the other people, really, you know, because I've seen examples where, you know, they humiliate them, and that that's not a nice thing to do to people. Yeah, well, there's more to this, you know. I mean, I don't consider myself a complete idiot. And no, I don't think was, you're an idiot. Yeah, it was okay. You know, I mean, 18 years was too long. The last year I spent in prison. Um, you said it was for my crimes. My only crime was that I protested against David Miscavige's uh, policies and uh, walked off my post. That was my only crime. So I was right. tried and, and uh, conv convicted in uh, treason, high treason. Did you have and, to go? Uh, to go where? To prison? Well, w how, like, it never actually uh, occurred to me, like, you know, I couldn't leave. That's why I escaped. So if you can't leave and you don't want to go to prison, then you're just going to go to a different prison. You know what I'm saying? If somebody is going to be watching you somewhere, you're going to but be... But why couldn't you leave? I mean, why would they want somebody who breaks the rules? Why uh, would they just want to kick you out and go, hey, see you later? That also is a little bit complicated. First of all, uh, so I uh, served 18, uh, 16 uh, years at uh, Int Base. Indbase is a secret headquarters location in a desert, uh, masqueraded as something else. Uh, it's it's a, it's a big deal. You know, the whole real church uh, top management is in there, and there are many secrets. Mm -hmm. So so which I knew all about. So that was one reason. So in order to leave from there, there is a procedure that you have to follow. So following that procedure is painful. I was trying to follow that procedure in prison, and uh, I could survive through it, and I finally ran away. You mentioned uh, you mentioned two guys in your book, Mike and, and Fred. Uh, and I, I looked at Michael this morning, and, and he had been his family. He'd been in, in, in Scientology from six years of age, but he laughed. He laughed, and he's you know kind of doing the out out 
outage or whatever yeah. uh, of the organization. Are you guys still in touch? Yeah, we are in touch. I have many friends who served with me, probably like at least a hundred, uh, even here in the Bay Area and all over the world, uh, in Sweden, in Thailand, in Costa Rica, in Hungary, you know, everywhere in Russia. So, so uh, yeah, there are many, many of us uh, outside now. Uh, unfortunately, there are a lot of people still inside who were my best friends, you know. Would you ha like to help them get out? No, I would like them to, I would like to help them to be happy and do what they want to do in life. And if they want to stay there, they should stay there. But I wish I could come and visit, which I can, you know. But if they want to get out, yes, I would like to help them to get out, if that's what they want. Right, right. Um, it's not, you, you see, it, like, let me just say this. People kind of uh, don't understand this one little point. It doesn't matter where you are and where you go. You take all your luggage with you. Sure. So getting out from somewhere doesn't mean that it's good. Getting into somewhere doesn't mean that it's good. You know, it's yeah, a little but I get that. But again, okay, I'm going to... You're taking freedom to the nth degree where I am saying, I want to be free to come and go as I please. I want to be free to see my friends if I want to see my friends. I yeah, want to be, yeah, you know, free to, to eat the food I want to eat and not sleep and be, you know, abused or whipped or whatever the case might be. Um, that doesn't sound like fun to me. Right. The other yeah, stuff nobody, sounds like fun. Traveling the world and, you know, that, that's fun. Um, yeah, no, nobody ever whipped me. There's no whipping. There's yeah, no well, intellectually whipping yeah okay yeah. <laughs> okay um so that's cool okay so you left you left the church and you called mom and dad boy were they surprised <laughs> to hear from you yes uh yes i ran away uh, basically i escaped uh, from this prison by faking an illness and so two security guards took me to a hospital and when they called me into one of the this, uh, you know, hospital room, like examination room or whatever, I just basically ran to the end of the hallway and found the door that led outside. And that was the end of that. And I just kept running. And then, yeah, I called my parents and they organized. Uh, I, I didn't have a penny in my pocket and, and no belongings of any kind. And, um, yeah, so somebody... Um, Pick me up and put me on a Greyhound bus and send me from LA to. So you're mid 40s at that time. I was uh, exactly 45. 45. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And you hadn't didn't have a family. Well, I had a family uh, when I was I had I was married. Oh, you were married in the church. Yeah. Yes. But when I was um, sent to prison in LA, uh, basically we were forced to divorce, which was fine with me at that point. Anyway, so I didn't have a family at that point, no. But I had a family before. Yeah, yeah. And do you have a family now? Yes, I have yeah. a family now. I have a stepson who is going to be a doctor. Nice. Um, he is going to be a family doctor. He is going through his re residency right now in West Virginia. I have a dog and a cat. I have a wife. I have a house. I have with our two, three cars. Nice. Yeah, <laughs> it's good. <laughs> Life which so which life do you like better well at this point i like this life better but i just want to mention that this life would have been a closed book for me if i didn't actually find scientology and didn't go to the sea because i was a complete uh idiot and uh, i would die young and i wouldn't even live to be this age you know well let, let's I, okay i'm gonna explore that with you for a second because here you are in russia opening yeah. up the church Scientology. And as soon as somebody says, do this, you're like, screw off. F you. I'm not doing anything you want me to do. Now, okay, aside from not being a very religious kind of attitude, I mean, you're still that guy who uh, was on the street going, screw off, get rid of, let go of my arm. I'm not going anywhere with you. What, like, do you see the similarity to that same guy? Well, sure, it's still me. But I am a happier yeah, you, a gentler you. immeasurably more able. I am, I am, I am, I, I was weak. I am not weak. There is nothing that brings me down now. Uh, I can plan. I can coordinate. I can, I can set an activity for like six months in advance and follow through. I don't throw away my bills into the garbage like I, I did when I was young because they were overwhelming. I don't get overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. I don't have 
many problems that I had in the past. Like basically, you know, it's it's still me, but like uh, really a postgraduate version. You know, like I know what I'm talking about. I lived alone in um, in the Bay Area after I graduated university, and I worked and stuff like that. And I'm telling you, everything was overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And uh, personal relationships were completely overwhelming. And construction is all personal relationships. So I had uh, problems with the crews. I had problems with my boss. You know, I had problems with the city inspector. I had problems. I I wasn't really, um, you know, I don't know how I would have survived. I, I really have you don't no think idea. You that was just youth? That you had th things to learn? Well, I don't know. I couldn't hold on to a girlfriend for longer than five months. I mean, I mean, it was, I was really a mess. And, uh, you know, I mean, I don't want to, like, label myself as psychotic necessarily, but there was definitely, you know, a lot to be gained from any kind of psychotherapy for me, you know. And uh, I got very effective uh, psychotherapy, which Scientology is very effective. That's the only thing that's going for it, that it has going for it, you know. And, uh, you know, and then also I left Scientology behind in 2005 uh, and uh, continued and progressed a lot farther than, than, than Scientology. And now it's a, it's, a, it's a completely different version of me, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Tell us about um, when you were in Russia and, and the KGB were, you know, they'd taken your visa, your passport, like you couldn't go home. You had no money, you couldn't go home. How, how afraid were you? Like, were you really afraid? Did you think that the church would come and save you or? Well, uh, the problem with the church coming and saving me was that even uh, getting a message out was difficult. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was all monitored by KGB and I was under surveillance. And uh, I didn't have money. Uh, I didn't have a, a plane ticket either because it expired. And it was scary. But again, nobody can take your freedom away from you just as nobody can take your existence away from you as a spirit. Like, in other words, it's not as... I wasn't as scared as somebody who thinks uh, that he came from Charles Darwin type thing, you know, but I was, uh, I was scared, obviously, mostly I was scared of uh, tortures and drugs and uh, humiliations and uh, this sort of thing. And also I was scared because at our first meeting, they already tried to recruit me and uh, turn me, you know, so that I couldn't live, I couldn't live with that, you know, mm -hmm. but I, it, I totally got an idea. Uh, going through those interrogations that I can't be broken the, uh, You know, I'm not gonna lie. You know, I, I knew that I could be broken. So some some other You know some other strategy had to be developed uh, Rather than uh, just uh, you know Squeeze tight and clinch my teeth and persevere through it. That wouldn't work. I needed a different strategy I needed like a, a real winning strategy and I came up with one, and uh, and I won, uh, you know. But uh, it was scary, but probably not as scary as it would be for some other uh, people, you know, maybe. Yeah, well, I mean, nobody wants to be arrested or beaten up in a foreign country and put in jail for whoever knows how long. Nobody right. knows where you are, right? It's right. That's kind of scary, for sure. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's scary, yes. Yeah. But uh, with KGB, it's a little different. They wouldn't put me in jail. I, I, they would just kill me, probably. Yeah, just shoot you. Well, that's. Yeah. I mean, even if you believe in reincarnation, being shot before you want to be shot is uh, <laughs> is not it's not on the, on the table. <laughs> yeah, it ruins your whole day. Just ruins your whole day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh well, at least you give your boots to somebody. Um, <laughs> so we're back in. We're back here. You you left the church. You call mom and dad. They send somebody to to pick you up. Where does your life go from there? You're 45. Where did you go? How did you pick up the pieces? So, so I, came, I came to, um, yeah, that's one of the things I'm telling you. So I spent a, a total of 18 years in the Sea Org, yeah. 16 years in probably the toughest outfit on earth, you know, and, uh, and uh, I've been through it all. So this actually wasn't a big thing for me. I wasn't overwhelmed at all. I came in here. Hey, look, I'm in my parents' house. I have a couch to crash on. I have three square meals a day. How bad can it get, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, so, and, and I have, uh, you know, an IQ of 160 and I know what I'm capable of. And, uh, I, I call myself sometimes a one man, a one man marching band, you know, I, but I know once you I leave, are they, are they 
going to send somebody to try and get you the church or you're out now? Like, are, were you worried that they would try to do something? Yes, um, not specifically worried. They're, they never use force, but they can send somebody to try to talk to me, which was oh, okay, okay but, but they didn't. What they did is they called me. They called me and they said that if I um, want to uh, leave, you know, that I left my passport with them, they have my passport. So I, I, I may want to come back and pick up the passport and also sign a few waivers that would preclude me from uh, talking about some of the secrets that I know and so forth. You know, and I said, uh, you know, to go back to Los Angeles and do that. And I said, yeah, I'll do that. Uh, however, I just have nothing right now. So if you pay for the plane ticket and pick me up from the airport and do this whole thing, then uh, yeah, I'll do that. So they sent me uh, money for the plane ticket and I uh, flew in there and they had me sign some waivers. They gave me back my passport, uh, stuff like that, and flew me back here. And that was the end of that. And I found the job or next day or the day after. I just called a few of my parents' friends uh, within the Russian community here. And a couple of days later, like literally, or maybe a day later, something like that, I was already standing in downtown San Francisco in the financial district selling hot dogs on the street, which is, you know, it's not a highly paid job, but you always have hot dogs. You know, again, how bad can it get? You know, you have soda, you have hot dogs. Hey, you know. So anyway, so I did that for a few months. And uh, from there, um, I got myself recruited as an estimator uh, for a large construction company. And uh, so I escaped in the very end of June of 2005. And in September of 2005, I already had a job. And then early 2006, I already bought the house. Did it feel surreal at all? Like not to have being organized and having all this, you know, in a group and, and did it feel surreal well, to you a little? It was, it, it was, it was uh, bad that there was no group. I had, I had like, I was among the best people. I really, really liked the guys, you know, and the camaraderie and the organization around you and stuff like that. So that was, that all was gone. So mm -hmm. I was on my own. Uh, the construction company I worked with is, uh, you know, is not the same as the C organization, you know, uh, different uh, people, different interests and stuff like that. But I worked there for several years. Um, you know, I mean, it's definitely something to get used to. But another thing that started happening is uh, PTSD started kicking in, which actually I didn't realize it ever did before. I kept uh, recurring nightmares about my life at the base. Um, and these li nightmares lasted for many years, probably, I don't know, seven, eight years. You know, I had nightmares and uh, stuff, you know, but then everything kind of went away and everything's good. So where did, you started to write in 2008, but this this being psychic and opening yourself up to spirituality and and you studied the, you said you studied many of the religions and tried many of them. Um, when did you know that you were psychic? Well, uh, okay, so first of all, I opened myself to spirituality in, 2000, uh, in 1987 when I started in Scientology. Mm -hmm. uh, Scientology is uh, spiritual. It is, uh, you know. But anyway, uh, so I started studying different religions and different angles. The, the thing is this. I kind of grew up in a round. I kind of worked out uh, a path for myself. And that path is mostly through imagination. Uh, based on my idea and my understanding of this world and how it's constructed and what it is in nature. And uh, eventually I started realizing that this imagination that I'm thinking is imagination is kind of giving way to reality. And uh, I am actually able to do things I'm imagining. Like in other words, I would imagine somebody's uh, lungs with a bunch of little um, like sores or whatever and how I'm healing them and stuff like that and all that. And the person would say, hey, wow, I feel much better, you know, and uh, I can breathe uh, full full breath. Well, thank you very much, you know. And I started kind of exploring and that, and that's how the psychic healing, healing came about. So it was uh, uh, accidentally, little by little. Um, I never was a psychic, never even thought about it, but um, it does work that way. Uh, I can't predict future or do bend spoons or anything you know but i can heal that's that's been proven many times is it you healing or is it spirit healing 
experience. What spirit? Yeah, I am spirit. Yeah. You're an individuated spirit. Well, yes. Uh, well, we are all individuated spirits. We are all individu individuated spirits, but a part of one. But we are still individuated. But, you're, I mean, but your book, your book on, on psychic, being a psychic or as a psychic healer, which is it? The book. Uh, you are a psychic, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the healer's handbook, yes. Yeah. Okay. So um, that book, who are you talking to in that book? And what do you hope that they will achieve when they read that book? Well, I, I, I'm talking to anybody who wants to read. Any, any person is a psychic, I believe. Um, there are a couple of uh, major obstacles in the way of manifesting the psychic abilities that they already have. Mm -hmm. And uh, those major obstacles are not lack of drilling. Like, in other words, there is also a bit of drilling and exercising and, and so forth, training that can be done. But that's not a major thing. Uh, the major obstacle is lack of certainty. Mm -hmm. That's how I figured it out. Like, if you take certainty to infinite degree, you know, then anybody is a psychic. Okay, so what keeps down certainty? So I figured that what keeps down certainty is, first of all, uh, not keeping one's nose clean, mm -hmm. which is a major, major factor, which is very difficult to, to deal with, kind of. You know, in, in our day and age and so forth, and people not wanting to be preached, and, and so on and so forth. It's very difficult. And uh, the second one is fear. So fear, f fear is easy to deal with. So, uh, you know, especially easy if one keeps their noses clean. You know, if the nose is clean, then the fear is also kind of easy. But in any case, there are techniques to handle fear mm -hmm. and meditations and so forth. So with those things out of the way, then it's just a matter of a little bit of drilling and we're all, we can all heal. We can all be psychic. Mm -hmm. And that's your definition of psychic is being able to heal or is it broader? Well, a psychic, a, a psychic is a person who exhibits certain extrasensory abilities and perceptions, some esoteric abilities that are not normal. So uh, being able to see inside the body. Being but they able are to, normal because we all have them. <laughs> yeah, we, we all have them, but we don't consider it normal. Yeah. You know? yeah. So that's why I call it psychic. But, uh, but seeing the future is a whole different thing, you know. That I don't know how to do it. I'm, uh, my wife always wants to win a lottery. So she keeps pushing me to, to explore that further. But, and I am working, you know, I'm doing research right now into DNA. But I'm more interested in DNA than how to win the lottery. Like somehow I can't, I can't turn that way very well. I don't think it works where people win the lottery, actually, when you're psychic. However, you can manifest yeah. getting what you want from that money. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, something like that. But uh, basically, uh, there are psychic abilities out there that are not available to me. But yeah. I have psychic abilities as well that I never expected existed. Like, yeah. uh, for example, uh, I think the last uh, the last thing I had was day before yesterday, when uh, you know a cancer patient, um, you know, uh, who lives in Detroit. Uh, you know, whom I never met and I've never been to Detroit, you know, like, and honestly, I am a little confused even where it is exactly, you know, and, uh, you know, and I was able to help him and so forth. That's pretty out there, I think. I would never expect myself to be able to do that. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Thank so what's, what's the future hold for you? When do you want, where do you see yourself going next? Well, I really like the Fuse Battalion and the sequel, which is uh, which is the Balthazar con uh, conspiracy, and I really would like to see those as movies. Okay. I have absolutely no clue how to break into Hollywood. I have no connections. I have no time. I have no abilities. <laughs> I'm really bad at networking. I hate uh, small talk <laughs> and cocktail parties. I don't drink at all. I, I don't like large gatherings of people because I keep picking up different people's thoughts and emotions and I mostly don't like them you know so I, I have I have a lot going against me but uh, I do have uh, certain things and abilities going for me you are funny and I hope to eventually... I give you that yeah thank you you have a good sense of humor and it's, it shows in your writing it's pretty hilarious um, I would just you know hey manifest it put it on your screensaver yes. it's a movie yay <laughs> exactly yeah yeah that's pretty much how I approach it yeah it will materialize one day yeah, yeah. Uh, good. Okay. Well, I wish you all the best. And do you, have, you. do you have your book in your? Do you have your your latest book in your in your thing? Let's hold it up. 
Well, this is my uh, this is my uh, latest book book about the psychic healing. Oh, there's really a poster like in the background. Okay, yeah, that looks good. Yeah. I see, see the poster. Uh, this is the golden fleece. Yeah. The golden fleece is, of course, this is me, and this is my horse, obviously, and this is my spear, and this is the Scientology cross. Yeah. And the, the golden fleece, uh, Scientology. By the way, if I can say just one small thing about Scientology, Scientology is effective and it works and it can get you somewhere, but it doesn't work nearly as well and doesn't get you nearly as far as a good meditation regimen, which is free of charge and free of oppressive organizations that uh, drive you bananas. You know, so the, 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 the dancers are out there and they've been there for at least 2,600 years, probably yeah. more. So, yeah. Yeah, this is uh, the Fuse Battalion. Now, I really like the Fuse Battalion. It's just okay. totally, you know, it's just my my book. What's that about? And this is my short stories collection, the Rotor Rotor. Tell, tell us about the 5th Battalion then. What's the premise of the story? The premise of the story is uh, that um, there was a failed invasion of Earth, an attempt at inv invasion of Earth uh, about 5,000 years ago in the Andes, when uh, Baltazar Confederate troops uh, advanced uh, contingent of the troops was uh, deployed in the Andes to build a base. It wasn't actually an invasion of the planet, it was just an idea of having a safe base in their war with their, with their enemy, the Mirabi Empire. And so they, so they were building this base in the Andes, and there are actually catacombs in the Andes. And it's actually based on some research that I found just incredibly fascinating myself. And of course, you know, of course it's science fiction, but it, it is actually interesting where the hell those catacombs came from in there, you know. But anyway, so uh, building, uh, building the base, uh, but Earth turned out to be a prison uh, uh, planet for Mirabi Empire, the enemy of Balthazar Confederacy, um, where the most incorrigible uh, cri criminals, the repeated offenders, spirits of, of repeated it's offenders were, were sent in here. So, so the, the, the prison guards here basically wiped out the advanced contingent and these people um, had been um, um, living here with us for 5,000 years, uh, you know, but they remember their origins and they're always trying to escape. That's how it is. Okay, okay, cool. Yeah. Sounds like a movie. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Michael Priv, thank you so much. Your books are available on Amazon and all yeah. the other local places. And I want to thank you for being so open about Scientology and, and bringing it up and allowing me to explore it a little bit more because I think people are very curious about it. Thank you. Thank you, Frankie. It was fun. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Okay, just hang in there. Goodbye, Facebook. We will see you tomorrow when uh, Mary McManus will be on with me. See you then. Just like.